Belkovsky, amazing pianist. Um, welcome. And you were an apprentice for the first time, I think, at Valley of the Moon Music Festival last year. Is that right? Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Did you enjoy it? How was it? I, I would say in terms of early music experience, I haven't had that many uh, festival experiences. It was such a safe haven for experimenting. And um, it's rare that you get to work with so few people and get such special attention and care. So I think, especially when it comes to early music, um, any kind of environment where you can explore and experiment with styles you, you're told are kind of forbidden. Uh, I don't know, there's, there's an allure about it. And I definitely had a great time. I'm so glad because we loved having you and we enjoyed so much your playing. What drew you to the forte piano in the first place? Because you're such a magnificent pianist. I'm sure you were a magnificent modern pianist. Um, how old were you and how did you find out about period instruments and, and why did you go in that direction? I, yeah, I thought about this before and I don't think there was any one moment or person. There were, I remember at Eastman where I did my bachelor's um, if I were, wasn't in the practice room, I was probably listening to the recordings. Uh, it had an amazing collection. And um, what I loved was the liner notes of early music records. They were just, they had the best marketing teams. So I would read and just, you know, take stuff in. I realized the recordings were also just better. They, they were more exciting. And I was hearing a Beethoven symphony that sounded fresh. And so I remember uh, this was kind of coinciding with, exploring early recordings, um, you know, students of Clara Schumann and colleagues of Brahms and things like that that blew my mind, first of all, that existed. No one told me Strauss conducted his own pieces. No one told me all this growing up. So uh, it was, it was a, a lot of um, interplay between like coming backwards from modern time and coming up from early music where I would, I found the forte piano. And I remember um, Eastman senior year, I, this was four years ago, three years ago, something like that. I uh, was preparing a Mozart concerto and uh, just decided to look up what the forte pianists were doing. Uh, and obviously they were playing it in a more interesting way than I was used to. And I definitely stole some licks, stole some ornaments, had a lot of fun uh, bringing that to the modern piano. And it was hard to look back. That's great. You probably know Eric is going to do all 32 Beethoven sonatas in a cycle, so he's going to be recording one a week and live streaming that. Um, what, which sonatas have you played? Do you have favorite ones? Can you tell us a little bit from your pianistic perspective um, how you feel about those pieces? And no, I've played I played several, uh, and because I mean these sonatas are unique to pretty much any kind of composer's output in that they track his growth. Uh, he's they were the, one of the last things he worked on and uh, his kind of uh, declaration into the musical scene in Vienna, like, look what I can do type thing. And, um, you know, dedicating his first pieces to Haydn and his, his last to his benefactors, but um, clearly showing how somebody who straddles the classical and romantic world, how they coped with, uh, with these formal changes, with, with the expectation of the audiences changing, you know, the conductor becoming a thing for the first time. A lot of, a lot of issues around him that probably influenced his writing, but uh, they are just the most varied and uh, indicative works for a composer. They don't, they don't show any gaps in his thinking. So I find my favorite uh, art, almost inarguably the most profound is uh, his, his last one. And I was fortunate enough to, to play that. Um, I, it ends in this, this kind of glorious, uh, uh, I don't know how you say it, it becomes so effervescent as this trill. He ends a lot of his late sonata with trill sections. And, and this one feels like it just evaporates into the ether. And it's, uh, it's really beautiful. and to think that he, if not, was fully deaf was, it, there's a lot of argument about like whether he was composing in a, in a deaf state or not, but it, it's just blows my mind that somebody could come up with something so unique uh, in, in his context. There's nothing that sounds like his late works, nothing that sounds like his late symphonies or his quartets. So uh, yeah, a really special. The 111 probably was my favorite experience.
Have you played it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that was um, one of the, I think it was the last one I played on Modern again. Ever, ever since then, I decided to, to work them out as much as I can on the Forte piano. Mm -hmm. uh, when I had this, you know, appropriate instrument available. So it's it's been, yeah, I, I haven't tried that one on a Forte piano, but I'm assuming there's no instrument that can work it out so much. I mean, it's, it's such a late and abstract work that I don't know how finding a Forte piano, he was deaf to the sounds of that, how, you know, how it bring out the best of the work. I feel like it's such a, a profound and abstract piece. Yeah. Well, it's really interesting hearing Eric practice all these in the house. Mm. I am used to most of them on the modern piano, I guess. And I'm like, oh, wow, that, that really does sound very different. How do you think you'll be spending this summer now that you have a lot more time than you thought? Uh, Rachel Wong and I uh, have uh, started an ensemble and that has, you know, for all intents and purposes, we put on hold, but I've been using this time uh, to brainstorm project ideas and uh, the ensemble itself, our, our name is uh, Dioscuri and the ensemble is anything from us in duo form to hopefully the, the grand idea is to, you know, put on cantatas and uh, chamber orchestra type things. And just the, whatever a concert master and a keyboardist can conceive hopefully is the, is the dream here. Um, and so there's been a lot of brainstorming projects, obsessions, and throwing stuff back and forth. Well, I mean, you guys will make an incredible team for something like that. And I can't wait to see what you guys are coming up with. I'm sure it's going to be great. Oh, she's brilliant. It's, yeah, I'm very looking forward to it. Um, and so maybe we can let people hear a little bit of what you and Rachel have been able to do together uh, during this quarantine time. Can you tell us uh, what that is? Sure. Uh, virtually, we paired up uh, a couple of videos of, uh, I recorded my part, she recorded hers, and uh, it's of the Bach uh, B minor obligato sonata. It's the third movement is very special on Dante uh, that he constructs in this, you know, typical Bachy, and it's, it's more or less an invention. I play the same thing she does two bars later, but you wouldn't realize that because it's the most glorious and gorgeous little ditty you'll ever hear. It's a favorite of ours, the Sonata in, in general, but that movement, um, yeah, it's, it's incredibly special. So, How was that experience of playing with each other from a distance? There, there were things we had to agree upon beforehand. I would, uh, I'm sure, because I sent my part first, I, uh, I'm sure she had to listen to it a couple of times to figure out where I might have taken time so that you're not caught off guard. Uh, and then it's a, a matter of being as sensitive as you would be in person. Just, there's, there are things in people's playings that you feel, uh, for example, timing that you can predict whether or not you see them. So as long as you're aware of uh, the, either the habits of the person or uh, what the inflection of a phrase might mean for the timing, it, it becomes more or less like collaborating in real life. It's nowhere near as fun because you're doing it after the fact and it's separated, but 
yeah, it was, it was a good experience. And I, I'm noticing myself that um, trying to play with people apart or even like socially distanced outside, um, what I'm missing is just people's breath and feeling yeah. what they might do in a certain moment. And, and even though we have like wonderful ears and we can respond from a distance, it really makes you appreciate what we get from each other when we're in the, the same room together. Yeah, and I mean, it, everyone feels uncomfortable when they record. Nobody likes that feeling as they as they know they're being, you know, tracked by a machine. But there's something about missing that breath that makes you realize it is almost like a living, breathing organism. The performance, the the rehearsal, whatever it might be, uh, that it, you do lose it when you have the veneer of recording and you're not working with each other in the same way. Um, okay, and then I would love for people to hear um, also this Mendelssohn Piano Quartet that we had you play last summer, which was like the pianistic feat of the century. Um, do you want to say anything about that, um, what your experience was like learning that piece and which movement you would want people to hear? Sure, yeah. Uh, so I guess to contrast that uh, idyllic Bach, uh, this Mendelssohn was his... 15 years old he probably was at the time uh his kind of entry into the musical scene by uh showing the conservatory i think i think it was leipzig uh, but showing the conservatory members how uh adept he was at you know playing the keys and it was a, a, effectively a piano concerto for uh four people and i remember walking into it going like oh you know i've, I've heard this trio writing it's and then thinking he's 15 years old is probably easier. No, it's it's more difficult than anything I'd ever played by Mendelssohn before. It's not. Uh, it was it was definitely a task, and I it was a lot of um, figuring out with the rest of the, the ensemble uh, how tempi work on forte pianos, how how textures could uh, be explored. I mean, um, I remember hearing this beautiful the cello sonata you, you played uh, with Christian at the, the festival. And, it was. The, I'm assuming you guys had similar responses. There's a lot of uh, a lot of texture that you can explore because he's not overwhelming your instrument from low range or anything. Like that. So there, there was a lot of fun uh, interplay between me and the cellist or me and the violist uh, that I didn't have to feel like I, 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 I had to back away from. This does feel like a piece that you may not hear so often because of. Uh, the, you could not yeah, watch <laughs> Exactly. Uh, but their movement uh, is, I guess, the, the little uh, gem as well. There's um, a bell-like middle section and around it, uh, it's, it's framed by scherzo-like flutes uh, and uh, flitting and little moments of twinkling uh, of stars. It's a really, really fun piece. Uh, well, they're, they're playing far fewer notes than I am, but uh, we're all having just as much fun. So there's a lot of uh, very prototypical mental school work. It's a very young guy, so it makes sense. <laughs>
Again, for learning that piece, that was really a different <laughs> course. <laughs> um, okay, so it's wonderful to see you. We cannot wait to work with you again as a Tank Trust laureate at the festival in Sonoma. So hang in there and good luck finishing school. Oh, thank you, and thank you so much for not just having me, but having me at the festival. And you and Eric have been so supportive, and I, I imagine that. That this is going to be a lifelong collaboration. I, I think you guys are some of the most special, special musical uh, advocates for early music. Thank, thank you. you.